John Morris has had a long and a unique political career, having served in the cabinets of three Labour Prime Ministers, Harold Wilson, Jim Callaghan and Tony Blair's. He was elected to Parliament as the Labour MP for Aberavon in 1959, but it's in 1974 when he was appointed Welsh Secretary that he made his mark. In that time he set up the Welsh Development Agency and tried to get Wales to agree to an assembly in a referendum back in 1979. But Wales said no. Uh, we've been rejected, our policy has been rejected by the people of Wales. Uh, and uh, this is as clear as pike stuff. When you see an elephant on your doorstep, you know it's there. This is a defeat, loud and clear. But by the end of the 20th century, Wales changed its mind and John Morris was back in power, witnessing the Queen open the first National Assembly. He is one of our elder statesmen and is still active in politics. So what does the grandfather of Welsh devolution make of the past and the present? You've served three different Prime Ministers. What was that like? Well, they were, they were all... Uh, I was very close to Harold Wilson and to Jim Callaghan, and um, I was a minister uh, in three departments and was Secretary of State for six years, uh, and they, they were very close relationships. They, I worked very closely with them. When I became Attorney General to Tony Blair, he was of a different generation, and um, we were not close. And I never had a face-to-face -face meeting with him. You know, I went. I was a member of the war cabinet, uh, the war in Kosovo, but uh, we did all our work in correspondence. So there was a generation gap there. I think I was one of yesterday's men. How 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 would you judge each of those three men? Who is the best to work for? Well, I think uh, Harold Wilson uh, was an outstanding prime minister uh, and his place in history has not been properly recorded yet. Uh, um, Jim Callaghan followed on and we were close personal friends uh, and uh, they put Britain on the map really and worked terribly, terribly hard and gave me full uh, support all the time and all the work that I did. I was in three junior departments, uh, power, transport and uh, defence, uh, and I was appointed to the Ministry of Power because I had a steel constituency in South Wales, and I supervised the drafting of the first steel white paper. And then under Barbara Castle, I was in transport, uh, and I chaired, and as a yeah, very young man, a joint committee of the civil service and industry uh, uh, and civil servants uh, to on the finances and management of British Rail. And the report was accepted in the Transport Act. It was a tremendous opportunity to a very young man. And what is interesting is this, we never had an ounce of evidence in the two years we sat looking at the future of management of British Rail that we should separate the track from the operation of the coaches. And this is what John Major did, probably the most disastrous uh, decision that was made by that government. And now they're going back now to trying to reorganize it because so many licenses have failed. But it was a very exciting experience for a young man. You, you've touched there about how Harold Wilson and history haven't quite collided yet and reputations do change over time. I want to talk about, about one of your colleagues, George Thomas. Now, his reputation has changed a lot since he has died. Uh, he was the Welsh Secretary in Aberfan. He was anti-Welsh language, some would say, anti-devolution. How do you think history has judged him? Well, he certainly had a very different um, viewpoint to mine. Uh, when he was Shadow Secretary of State for Wales, after he'd become, been Secretary of State for Wales, I steered clear of Welsh politics and got on with my profession. There was no role for me. And it was a huge surprise to the nation of Wales and in me, to me, that I was appointed Secretary of State for Wales. He had expected to be reappointed. But Harold Wilson couldn't have two Secretaries of State, one in Scotland and one in Wales, who were opposed to devolution. And I was, since my young days in 1953, 
in Cambridge, an advocate, an architect, I hope, of devolution. You couldn't have a, a government with a flagship legislation when the two sections of states were opposed to it. Willie Ross in Scotland had a conversion in the middle of August. George Thomas became deputy speaker and a very good speaker, if I may say so. But he politically, he couldn't continue when the flagship legislation was to introduce like a devolution to Wales and Scotland. Talking of the 1979 referendum here in Wales, it was lost, clearly. Do you think it ever could have been won? No. Uh, we, 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 I, I, I was at fault. Uh, I didn't prepare the ground sufficiently. My colleagues were at fault as well. Um, we, it was premature. Uh, uh, the South Wales thought it'd be run by North Walians. North Walians thought it'd be run by South Walians. And uh, they were prepared to vote nationalist in North Wales, but not willing to have an assembly in Cardiff. So it was a great disaster. Then Thatcher came in, and over a period of time, uh, we realized, and Wales realized, that if we had control of many of the aspects of Welsh political life, that things would be better for Wales. And even then, only by a very small majority, that devolution came about. I had the privilege uh, having started as far back as 1953, eventually in 1999, of presenting the Wales Bill in Welsh and in English to the Queen in Cardiff at the first sitting. I had a tremendous opportunity, which was given to me as, as Attorney General, because I sat on the Cabinet Committee and had a second chance of doing what I was been fighting for. I was very, very lucky, and I th thank the God that I had the chance to do it. And it worked, as we've seen in the pandemic. Well, as you say, uh, devolution did come about and you were there as the assembly, as it was, opened on its first day. <coughs> Has devolution panned out as you expected it would have? Yes, I think it has. Um, but I, I have, I'm on record as saying that uh, given that so many years have passed, that uh, the Welsh government should set up a committee uh, 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 an independent committee of wise men and women uh, to look at the workings of devolution because the spending pattern is different in Scotland, Wales uh, and, uh, and England. Uh, uh, one of my grandchildren had to go to, went to St Andrews University and had to pay huge fees there. The Scots don't. There are all sorts of benefits they get in Scotland because of the uh, subsidy but from Westminster. So we need to look at how devolution is developing. What is the best interest of the United Kingdom? And I'm very surprised <coughs> while I would fight to defend the right of each devolved assembly and parliament to decide its own policies in the fields devolved. I am surprised that there be these minor differences between the policies in Scotland, Cardiff and Westminster. Science, I would have thought, has no national boundaries and epidemics cross the borders. I defend their right, but I'm surprised that so much has been made of so many minor differences. Hence, I believe that it would be in the interest of the Welsh government to set up an examination how far they've succeeded and how far has it worked and how does it fit in to a constitutional requirement of the development of the whole of the United Kingdom. Of course, for most of your political life, we've been, we've been talking about having a, an, an assembly or a parliament in Scotland and Wales. Now we're talking about independence in Scotland and to a lesser degree here in Wales. What is, it, what is your assessment on the future of the United Kingdom? Well, I think that um, the Scotsman will realise that, um, that the uh, independence is very problematical. Uh, when you count the votes, as I made a speech on the Queen's speech the other day, when you count the votes uh, for the unionist parties in the last uh, election in Scotland and the non-unionist parties in the Scottish election, the majority was still against. It, uh, the dependence of the Scots on subsidy by Westminster and the fact that the price of oil has gone up and down like a yo-yo, I think that should 
being very salutary, and I suspect that it would be very dangerous for Ms. Nicholas Sturgeon to ask for a vote now. They're not going to do so. There are other priorities, in fairness to them. But when the time comes, I think it will be very problematical. And I don't think there is a feeling for it in Wales either. The, fe the feeling in Wales is less, according to polls, than it is in Scotland. But do you think you could ever be persuaded for an independent Wales? No, I, I don't think so. I think we have more to gain by working together. Uh, the boundary, the traffic between Wales and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and London is so heavy. Uh, I made a deliberate policy to spend all my funds that were available to me on road building to build, to build good communications west to east and east to west, both in North Wales and South Wales. Hence, I made it a priority to finish the M4. And in the same way, the A55, I planned it in North Wales because trade goes east to west. And that's the terribly importance for the economy of Wales as a whole. Now, you've had many honours and uh, distinctions over your career, but you've got a very rare one in that you are a Knight of the Garter, very, very ancient an honour. Now, inevitably, thoughts will turn to the future of the monarchy, uh, given the Queen's age. How do you feel the next, the next period will be? Well, uh, we are looking at the, uh, the future. I don't think there'll be any substantial change. Um, the Prince Charles has taken an enormous interest in Wales. Uh, he has a home in Wales. He spends as much time as he can, given these other responsibilities. I don't visualize any change whatsoever. Uh, I've been very honored, a very rare honor and very surprising honor. I still haven't got over it uh, of being made a garter knight. But there it is. You know, these things come. Uh, uh, to one uh, unexpectedly. I'm very grateful. Do you, I interviewed Lord Ellis Thomas um, on the 70th anniversary or 70th birthday of Prince Charles, and he thought that Wales hadn't made enough of Prince Charles as Prince of Wales to promote Wales around the world. Is that a view you share? Well, I, I'm not an expert on that. Um, he spends as much time as he can in Wales. Uh, I've been to his home in Wales many times. Um, he's always welcome when I was Lord Lieutenant of David, which I was for a few years. Um, the welcome to the royal family and himself in particular was tremendous wherever we went. And during the Silver Jubilee, I was the minister who planned it, or supervised the planning uh, from Holyhead right down to Cardiff. Uh, and uh, there was a great welcome. Uh, and uh, I don't visualize anything. Uh, and one final one on, on, the, on the monarchy is that one day there will be a new Prince of Wales. Now, you'll remember what happened uh, with the protests back in 1969 and the investiture. Is the, is the, has the time come for a different approach to where it comes to the, to the Prince of Wales or should it still go to Prince William? Well, I, I was present at the investiture like most Welsh MPs. Um, I, I, it, was in, it was done in the period of that time and probably was appropriate, but I don't think we have a, a taste for ceremonies these days in the same way as there used to be, in partial at least. So I don't think there would be any great fuss uh, when eventually uh, the Prince of Wales, the new Prince of Wales. Now, you're still very active in the House of Lords and you'll take a keen interest uh, as a politician, but also as a lawyer in, in these international trade agreements that the UK government are currently signing. What is your thoughts as a, as a man who comes from a farming stock on the deal with Australia? Well, I, I sit uh, every week uh, on the International Agreements Committee, which vets all the agreements which have been brought in uh, following our exit from Europe. Uh, it's um, demanding work, detailed work, uh, and I have to put my personal interests on one side to look at it objectively as a lawyer. Uh, we have to recommend to the House of Lords what our views are. Uh, I think there's a period of enormous uncertainty for Welsh agriculture. Uh, so far as New Zealand is concerned, we have a very good relationship because they're 
imports of lamb come at a time when our lamb is not available. But the Australians are hoping, we're not really very, very big beef producers, are hoping to increase their trade by tenfold from Australia for beef. Well, that combined, uh, uh, if there was a big change, both in meat and other products, uh, then it could be cause great uncertainty and great difficulties for Welsh agriculture. Welsh agriculture is made up in part of small family farmers. They are the heart of the Welsh community, uh, and they have played a, a very important role in ensuring that a certain way of life continues. They've got to be competitive, and they have increased their productivity over the years. I remember the great changes that came about in during the war. Uh, I was a, a little boy, a young boy at that stage, and I saw the changes then. They followed on, uh, and uh, some of our agricultural uh, uh, experts have played a leading role in helping agriculture to meet the needs of today, and may it continue. But it's going to be very difficult and could be very hazardous, and I wouldn't like to be too sure about the future. If you could have your political time all over again, what would you change? Not a great deal. I have been very fortunate. I have continued my interest in steel, which I take part in the House of Lords in debates and keep an eye on what's happening in Port Albert. Um, I keep an eye on developments in agriculture. I don't speak much, if at all, on political matters, pure political matters, but I speak on legal matters mainly in the House of Lords. Um, I, I don't think, I've had a very full, a very happy life with the support of my wife and the family. And um, I, I don't think I would want to change anything. That may be a very reactionary view, I concede. But I've enjoyed myself and continue so to do. And I hope I'll be allowed a few more years to participate in the work in the House of Lords. And finally, how do you feel about being a, a pub quiz question answer? Because if the question was, who was the last surviving member of Harold Wilson's cabinet? The answer is going to be John Morris. Well, well I probably am, I should think. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I've been in Parliament 62 years. I, uh, and uh, I, I shall be going there this afternoon for a short while. And uh, uh, it's not a very heavy week this week. Uh, I've got this International Agreements Committee on Wednesday. But I, I take part many times a week, both at questions and in debates. Uh, and on the Queen's speech, I made a speech. Uh, and um, I, uh, so far as I'm able to and talk sense, that's for others to judge, uh, I hope to continue to participate. But mainly in le on legal matters and... Uh, as a former Attorney General, and also on Welsh affairs. I don't roam around the huge political field which is available. I, my expertise is limited. But on matters of law, I spent two very happy years as Attorney General, which was my main ambition in life as a young man. And I was able to participate in it and to see a, de a devolution coming about as one of its earlier architects I was very, very privileged to play a small part. Lord Morris, we're very grateful that you joined us here on Sharpard. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Well, one, uh, very happy interview. Thank you for your help.